we're going to still continue our sermon series about inspiring integrity. It's an important issue, particularly when we just watched the video that we just saw, that the fifth gospel that people are going to be paying attention to is going to be you. Are you actually acting out what you believe? And that's the title of our sermon for this morning, Acting Upon Proper Convictions. I'm going to read a scripture that's found in James, and pretty much the whole entire book of James is just kind of a real cold slap in the face, gets your attention, wakes you up real quick, and remember that we're talking about acting upon proper convictions. This is what the book of James says, James chapter 4, verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Will you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you and uh, we just ask God that you would enable us to be able to speak these words of hope and life and encouragement. God, we want to be encouraged to be people to live out our convictions. We want to be people who not just say what we believe, we want to be people who act upon what we believe. And Heavenly Father, I'll pray that you help me. I'll pray that you would anoint me here this morning to preach this message and that that your word would have its proper place and have a profound effect in our life. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, and God's people said, So here in just a little bit, I'm going to ask us five questions. And I'm going to ask you to reflect upon these questions. And we're going to take these questions and we're going to mirror those in the personal life of an Old Testament character. But are we living out what we say we believe? Because sometimes we can say a certain statement of faith We can give an affirmation of what we believe, but we don't actually live it. I'm going to be very convicting. I'm going to be very uncomfortable here this morning. I'm going to be very, very uncomfortable. But you still have to love me. Did you know that? We say that the main objective in the Christian walk is to see lost people come to Jesus Christ. I'm going to be be very personal with you here. Don't answer it. Don't answer it out loud. But when's the last time you witnessed to someone and tried to show them the cross of Jesus Christ? Because if you say, man, the most important thing is, man, we, we need to be about our Father's business. We need to try to bring people to salvation. We need to help them to become followers of Jesus Christ. But when was the last time that we, we talked to someone and we had that on our mind? Are we acting upon proper convictions? Or how about this? God wakes you up in the middle of the night, God puts his finger right directly in your life, God prompts you to, to stir up something in your mind, and you, you are in agreement with God at that very moment. You say, yes, Lord, I agree with what you're saying to me. But then we don't act upon what God puts upon our heart. Well, This is what James says. James says, if you know to do what's right, and you don't do it, you have sin. Man, raise your hand if you think, man, that's, that is a cold slap of water r- right there. Man, that's, I, don't, I, I can't speak for you, but that it sure is convicting because how many times has God laid something upon our heart and we've just put it off because we thought somebody else would do it or we would do it some other time or we've been in agreement and we said, yes, Lord, I would submit to that, but then... We don't actually do that. Man, that's that's some bitter medicine. But but we, because we believe in the Word of God, we believe that the Word of God is divinely inspired. We believe in the Word of God. We, We believe that it is alive and that it is breathing, that it is a living organism in order for us to to be infused with that and to live it and take our faith and to be faithful to what God's Word says, what we're going to do here this morning 
we're going to do a little bit of examination. We're going to look at five questions, and I want you to reflect. I want you to act upon, and I want you to think about these questions, and then I want us to reflect those in the life of an Old Testament character by the name of Jonah. Question number one. Will my convictions matter in a year from now? In a year from now, because let, let, let me be honest with you. Every single person here has some personal convictions that they pack in their pocket. Every single one of us. I'm going to be honest with you. Some of those personal convictions come from the way that you were raised. Raise your hand if you were, was ra ever raised up in a holiness Pentecostal church where where none of the women were allowed to wear pants. Yeah, right? And you guys remember some, some of the churches where women were never allowed to have their hair down. They, they wore them up. So it looked, sort of looked like a beehive, didn't it? Just, or like a hornet's nest. Just stuck way up, right? You guys ever heard, heard of the churches that didn't allow makeup? Did you ever find, did you ever find that in the Scripture? Did, did Jesus ever teach on that? What I found often is that churches take their personal convictions and try to find a scripture that they think will support their personal uh, uh, convictions. But there's no biblical basis to do that. Did you know that this is what Jesus said? Jesus told us, the New Testament church, to teach and to help them observe all things that I've taught you. Man, there's a lot of things that some churches are teaching that Jesus never said. Never part of Never part of those types of convictions. And some of us have some convictions. I was told of a story of a church back in the 1950s. A man came into a church and he was pastoring. They thought he had a wonderful personality. They thought he was a people person. They thought he was a tremendous public speaker. And he had been there for a couple of months and then they found out that he had a TV. Guess what the church did to him? Kicked him out. He's unholy. He's got a TV. I don't know about you, but when I was a boy, when I was growing up, we only had three channels. Can I get an amen? And I, I don't know about you, but if, if, you got, if you got two at the same time, man, your antenna was smoking hot. But I say thank God for a younger brother. Can I get an amen? Hey, Jeff, we're not getting in channel 13. You're going to have to go out and keep... Yeah, get, turn it to the left. <laughs> You guys remember those days? We have come a long way. But ask yourself this question. Will my convictions, will my personal convictions matter in a year from now? In a year from now, will my personal convictions, are they actually going to, is it going to matter? Are they based upon biblical truth that Jesus taught because I want my convictions to be what Jesus taught particularly in the fact that if Jesus said teach people teach your culture teach your generation to observe all things that I've taught you so if it's not in there man we're we're we're, we're doing the world a disfavor can I can I just tell you that often I think that sometimes our personal convictions get in the way of people being able to see the cross. Is it any wonder that some churches are not, not they're no longer able to connect with the secular society because their personal convictions get in the way and obscure the vision of who that Jesus really is. And may we never, may we never, ever do that. I'm not saying that we compromise. I understand that there are people who are going to be very, very upset at us because we hold to biblical values. Can I get an amen out of that? I know that. And I, I'm, I'm not going to apologize and we're not going to make any substitution when the Scripture is very clear. But when the Scripture is silent, man, it is completely nonsense. And even the Apostle Paul says for the church to avoid such nonsensical types of debates because because those debates stir do nothing but stir up strife and the churches listen i have seen churches 
argue and split over the color of carpet that they're going to that they're going to hello people that's what you walk on you're supposed to walk on carpet not you're not supposed to walk on one another and yet people people make mountains out of a molehill out of their own personal convictions and it's ridiculous people argue over the names over the door what denomination they are that's one of the reason why we decided to go non-denominational there's only one name here that we lift up and it's not the baptist it's not the pentecostal it's not the methodist it's not the presbyterian it is the name that is above all name his name is jesus somebody say amen in the lot of scripture to your personal convictions the convictions that you have will it make a difference in a year from now do the convictions that you hold to are they supported in scripture and the convictions that you hold to will it help to see transformation in the life of another person that brings us to question number two do i treat my possessions as if they belong to god We look at the Old Testament character, Jonah. And you guys are real familiar with this historical background where God comes and speaks to him. He, he's the prophet. He is a mouthpiece of God. Did you know that your life, that your life is being read by people in your neighborhood? Did you know that your life is being read by people at work? Did you know that? Because you proclaim that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and people are looking at you. That, that's why in that little video it says you are the fifth gospel. I mean, let's be honest. The majority of the people are never going to take the time to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You are that fifth gospel. You are the book that they will read each and every day. You are the book that they will look into and they will sense your emotions and they, they'll sense what type of uh, integrity, person of integrity that you are. They're going to look at you. And when we talk about those issues, do you treat your possessions as if they belong to God? Jonah certainly did not. Jonah, when God told him to go into Nineveh and to help to preach a message of hope and restoration to these people who lived in Nineveh, Jonah decided he's going to go somewhere else. I'm going to get on a real personal level here. Did you know that you've been bought? You have been bought. And the scripture is very clear when it says in 1 Corinthians, it says, therefore, you have been bought with a price. And did you know that it goes on to say, you don't even belong to yourself. You've been redeemed. You, you guys know what redeemed means? If I took something to the pawn shop and gave it to them, whoever comes in and is willing to pay the highest price, that person now becomes the owner. If everybody's with me, say amen. And did you guys know that when Jesus said, when he, Jesus said, when he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished? The original language there means a payment has been made in full. A payment. It's, it's been paid. The moment that you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you no longer belong to yourself. You belong to him who paid for you. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> And so do I treat my possessions as if they belong to God? And Jonah did not. Not only did Jonah treat his body in a fashion saying, I am not going to go where you want me to go. I'm even going to take the money that you've given me and I'm going to use it in a manner that won't honor you. Because he, instead of going to Nineveh, he bought a ticket. He used God's money to go in the other direction. And bought a ticket and thought he was going to go to Tarshish. Gets even worse. He's on a boat. 
And all of a sudden, a big storm comes in. Now that the storm has come in, Jonah is now wasting precious time. He's wasting not only his, his own body, he's not only wasting his, God's money, but he's wasting God's time. Time is of essence. And so finally, they're trying to figure out who's, who's, the, who's the culprit of causing this storm that they are experiencing. And finally, they said, well, th- there's a sleeper. There's a sleeper down at the bottom of the boat. and Bring him on up here. Maybe he's the culprit. They find out that he's the culprit. Jonah confesses. Let me tell you something. Had Jonah just said that he was sorry to God, the storm would have already ended. If he would have just repented right then at that moment, everything would have been okay. But he doesn't. He makes his predicaments. He makes his habits of making bad choices to make another bad choice. And said, just throw me out into the sea. And so, they listen to him, and they throw him out into the sea. And then the storm stops. The scripture says that God prepared a great fish. I want to tell you something. The storm did not stop because of Jonah to receive peace. The storm stopped so the whale could see where Jonah was. Can you imagine what Jonah was thinking when he was in the water and the storm stopped? He's floating around. Hey, this ain't so bad. And then can you imagine what he was thinking when he heard all that big gush of water coming at him? I don't know about you, but if I think if I was doing the dog paddle or kind of staying afloat and I heard all that water. I, I'm not for sure if I'd want to turn around or not. You see, if our convictions say that everything that we have is given by God, is given for the glory of God, everything that you have is given by God and given for the glory of God. And Jonah didn't want to do that. As a matter of fact, he gets swallowed by a whale. He is literally engulfed. He is swallowed by this whale. And Jonah is so bitter. He is so angry. He is so rebellious against God. You would think, okay, God, I get it. I, I'm totally, totally getting it. I get the message. You want me to go to Nineveh? I'll repent. I'll repent right now. Had Jonah done that, everything would have been okay. But Jonah didn't repent on the first day. Jonah didn't repent on the second day. It took three days for hard-headed Jonah to finally repent. You guys know anybody who's hard-headed? There's some people, man, it takes a long time for them to understand what God's trying to do in their life. And finally, Jonah repents And he goes to Nineveh and he preaches this marvelous message of hope and restoration. And he has a great revival that breaks out. And then he runs up to the hill. Because now he wants to see God's punishment come down. And that leads us to question number three. Am I currently treating people the way God calls me to? Do you have anybody who's very annoying in your life? Do you have someone in in your inner circle that you have to see at least three to five times a week that sometimes if you spend more than two or three minutes, they somehow, some way, find a way to get on your nerves? Ask yourself this question based on these convictions because God calls us to love people not based on what they look like on the outside. And God calls us to love people not based on their whether they annoy us or not. God calls us to love all people. You see, I will treat people correctly if I'm acting and if I'm thinking out of 
proper convictions. If my convictions are right, if they're based upon biblical values instead of personal values, then I will find a way to treat people the way God calls me to. Now, come on, be honest. Be honest. I want you, I want you to be dead dog honest this morning. Raise your hand if you sometimes find yourself being impatient with people. And have you ever thought, God, why, why did you surround me with such crazy people? Have you ever thought that? It's like, I mean, I'm telling you, that there have been days at work where I've, I've literally, I've done this. I went down, I went down to the warehouse. I said, all right, what'd you do with them? They said, do with what? Stupid pills. Because half of the hospital's walking around stupid. You, here I am trying to do my job, take care of patients, take care of supply and equipment, and all you're doing is passing out stupid pills. You ever feel that way? It's like, for crying out loud, my kids woke up this morning and they took a whole bottle of stupid pills. <laughs> Don't worry. There there's been days where people said that about you. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Am I currently treating people the way that God calls me to? Husbands, I'm calling you. I'm calling you out right here, right now. Husbands, I'm calling you to treat your wives the way that God calls you to do that. Wives, I'm calling you to treat your husbands the way that God calls you to. Parents, I'm calling on you right here, right now, that you be a person of integrity and live out the way that God calls you to love your children and raise them up and, and help them to and undergird them with a life of integrity and character. Do I build people up or do I find myself trying to tear them down? Do I embrace people even in their moments of ignorance and being impatient with them? Or do I want to hurry up and shove them away and get them out of the way? Man, it is so compelling when you look at the life of Jesus Christ because He would embrace some of the most messed up people ever. That brings us to question number four. Do I seek God in all my life? That means in every decision that you make, you want it to honor God. In every decision that you make, you want it to bring glory unto Him. Have you ever made a decision, you ever made a choice that you thought you were big enough and mature enough to make on your own and just a couple of weeks later, you wanted to take a hammer and hit yourself in the forehead and say, why did I do that? Can I get an amen out of that? I mean, it's, it's really... <sighs> Have you ever just opened up the, the, the freezer door and you see that tub of chocolate ice cream? If you guys are with me, say amen. And you're like... Well, I really haven't had supper. <laughs> I forget supper. I'm having the tub of ice cream. Can I get an amen? And so, like, and you're like, I'll only, I'll, I'll only have three, three scoops. I'll, I'll only have three scoops. But your elbow doesn't know how to count. And so, like, instead of three... You're at 13. And then an hour and a half later, you're, you got this belly ache and you're going, why? Why did I do that? Do, do I seek God in all of my life? God, I, I seek your face. We sang a song this morning about God, I want to seek your face. And I don't want it just to be in the worship here on Sunday morning. God, I want to seek your face and Monday through Saturday as well. God, I want to honor you. I want to live a life of integrity so that when people see me, they see beyond my flesh and bones and they see that there is something that helps me to navigate through life, something that's greater than just myself, to being a person of integrity because God, the very presence of His Spirit, lives inside of me.
Am I allowing God to help me in my decisions? Am I allowing God to have honor and respect in the choices that I make? And the relationships that I'm building? Am I seeking God in my life for the use of my talents? And then the last question that we want to ask this morning is, have I spoken to people that God leads me to? Revival had broken out. There were two messages that had been preached in the city of Jerusalem. One was on the day of Pentecost. And then we look in Acts uh, chapter 3. We see that once again, Peter and John are getting ready to go into the gate that's called Beautiful. They preach another message. Um, They see a man who's been lame, who's been there at the temple door. And they see him get healed. And once again, a great number of people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So revival is breaking out. Man, it's, it's going wonderful. But God sends Philip out of the city and he doesn't even know where he's going. God, God has just sent the Spirit and he's convicting him and sending him out. And as he's walking outside of the city, he sees this chariot. And this chariot happens to have an Ethiopian diplomat who is representing the providence of Ethiopia. Uh, the queen at the time, her name was Candace. And so... Philip is obedient to go and to speak to this person who finds him reading out of Isaiah concerning Jesus Christ, a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. And so Philip comes out and the chariot stops and he shares faith in the life of this man. He speaks and helps to cultivate faith in this man. This man says, well, right here is water. What would hinder me to get baptized right now? I mean, it is one of the most beautiful stories about a person taking the time to share faith in the life of another. I, I, I will never forget, as long as I'm in my right mind, I don't think I'll ever forget. Years ago, it was long before Carol and I even had any, any children, and we were, we were on the road. We were, we were passing my cousin's house, And all of a sudden, just the thought overwhelmed me that the next time that I saw my cousin, I needed to witness to him. I needed to tell him. I needed to look at him in the face and tell him that God has helped to transform my life. And I'm no longer the same individual that I used to be. And I wanted to I wanted to share that with my cousin, Gene. I wanted just to do that. And as we popped over the hills, we saw the house that he was raised up in and um. Man, just God, God over flooded me with just the thought of doing that. It was about 1030 at night. And lo and behold, who do you think was in my at, at my parents home when we came there to visit them? It was my cousin Gene. Now, I know I know nobody's ever done this, but I did that night. I started making excuses with God. God, you know, I've had a hard day at work. Man, it's been traveling. It's, it's great to see my cousin. But God, I'm not going to tell him about you now. I'm not going to tell him what, what, what a great, wonderful work that you've done in my life. I'm not going to tell him that. I'm not going to tell him. I'm not going to share with him that you've called me in to preach. I'm not going to share any of that with him because, God, I just want to go to bed. I didn't get any sleep that night. Because God said, you asked for the opportunity and you didn't do it. The very next morning, man, I was just so exhausted on top of being disappointed because I didn't speak to the person that God had put in my path. And so uh, we were going to go to Carol's sister's house. I was going to go and look at a truck. I was going to go look at a Chevy S10 pickup truck. He said, we're going to go to her house, so... On the way there, we stopped at this little community. I was at the gas station. And who do you think, as we were getting ready to fill up, who do you think left the gas station? 
God was like, Dwayne, I'm giving you another chance. I hopped back in the car and I looked at my wife. I went, follow that car! Man, this was something like out of the movies. It was wonderful. It's like, if I would have thought about it, I would have slid across the hood of the car like the Dukes of Hazard. Follow that car. <laughs> so we're following my cousin. My, my, my cousin's wife had just had a baby, and he was going to the local hospital. So we finally caught on with him, and I came out of the car, and I said, Hey, Gene, Gene, I, I just, I just want to tell you something. Man, I, and I should have told you this last night. I, I just want to share it with you. I want to tell you that God has done a marvelous work in my life. He has saved me from my sins. His very presence is living inside of me right now. And God has called me to preach. Gene, I am a different person. Gene looked at me kind of weird, like your cousins normally do. He went, oh, uh, okay. And that, that was it. But, man, I felt so happy that I had done my part. If our convictions tell us, the, the scriptural convictions that share with us that we need to speak faith and cultivate faith and hope and love in the lives of people that we're around, if we're not doing it, the scripture says that it is sin. Man, I hope, I hope today, and it's my prayer. I'm going to pray with you here in just a little bit, but it is my prayer that when we leave this building here today, that we are people of faith who act out upon the convictions that God has given to us and that we take to heart these five questions and that we reflect upon them. As the worship team comes, I'm going to ask everyone, if you would, just to quickly bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the great name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, your, your word today, it is powerful and it is convicting. And I'm going to ask God that you help us to be people. I'm asking you right here and right now that you help us to be the men and women of the kingdom of heaven, God, that you call us to be. Help us to live a life of integrity by living out our convictions to live out the convictions that you lay upon our hearts that we not only think proper convictions but we live out proper convictions as well help us to do that lord we ask in the name of your wonderful son jesus christ amen